And our next presentation will also be virtual. And this time it will be live. Uh, so let's welcome Dr. Nandu Goswami with his innovative approaches to teaching integrative medicine in Western medical universities. I will ask the studio for connection, please. Hello, Dr. Goswami. Good morning. I Good morning. Can you, hear me? can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Uh, we apologize for our late start. Um, you may begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers, particularly Thomas, for organizing such an event. And I'm really uh, honored and uh, it's a great pleasure that I would like to share some of my experiences uh, in uh, in a complementary and integrative medicine, because this is really important aspect, I believe, in, in medicine. Uh, some of you I've seen already on the screen, so I do know. Uh, so hello, my dear friends that are present in uh, in physical presence there. I greet you all, and this, uh, I hope we, I see you next time in person. But um, today, I would just like to share with you online uh, the challenges and, and actually how we can perhaps integrate uh, you know, our complementary or what I would actually call integrative and even more health promotion kind of education into medical university. So I'm an associate professor at the Medical University of Graz in Austria, not Australia. And, uh, you know, I mean, all of you are experts in this area, but for example, when we talk about aspects related to Ayurveda, you know, like meditation and every single aspect, this is a practice that has been carried out for centuries in India and in other parts of Asia. But what is really fascinating is that uh, despite this practice being uh, quite common in uh, uh, parts of India and uh, other parts of Asia, it has been quite a, a long journey for these uh, medicines to come into the Western world. And yes, today we talk a, a little bit about yoga, uh, kind of some little bit of acceptance with the yoga, but also overall, if you look around the world generally, uh, in the Western world, there are still a lot of misconceptions and uh, just uh, not clear, really understanding of these concepts here, and they are therefore not well received. So. So, for example, Western practitioners, and you know, I'm myself a medical practitioner, uh, MD, trained in Western medicine, and you find that when we talk about the, to our Western practitioners, uh, I don't mean the colleagues who are here today in our forum, but I'm talking on average, there are a lot of preconceptions that they have. There is also a lot of uh, skepticism. Can this really do this? And, and therefore, it's not a surprise that uh, over the years, Concepts such as Ayurveda and, you know, other even TCM and other aspects have taken the name of alternative medicine, which I think is pretty sad because this is not, into, uh, it is not alternative, it's rather integrative. And uh, again, well, you know, in the Western world, as you heard from our previous uh, uh, presenter, we rely on publications, we rely on scientific evidence. And what is the evidence? And if you look at most of the publications, uh, maybe perhaps in the last 10 years, it's been a lot of Western-based publications. But in the, over the years, the publications have all arisen a lot from, you know, the Indian subcontinent mostly. And that makes a little bit of bias that, of course, you would want the Indians to endorse Ayurveda. That is the general conception in the Western world. And there's also this stupid, un unnecessary belief, and I think a complete false belief, that some of the data emerging from uh, developing countries are not correct, and maybe they were not subjected to proper peer review. Maybe, for example, it could be Ayurveda companies sponsoring that kind of research, so there was a heavy conflict of interest. You know the typical issues that we have with this kind of publication. So when I set out to do that, the first thing I wanted to ask, and is that, how can we raise this awareness with our Western medical practitioners? Regular dialogue would help. And But I believe, myself being a medical doctor, and again, I repeat this, and many of you know this, I am not an Ayurveda practitioner. What I am is actually a Western-trained medical researcher working at a Western university called the Medical University of Graz, where we believe in evidence-based medicine and not prominent-based medicine, which is like some prominent scientists said that, we believe in that. So we talk about evidence. And I was asking myself that in, I am in this unique position, sitting here in Austria, where I could do amazing work. 
actually using the tools that we use to validate a drug. So for example, if a new pharma company finds a drug, how do they validate the, the process? Why don't we do that for our medications such as Ayurvedic products, or for that matter, anything? If we talk about Panchakarma, for example, in Ayurveda, how can we validate that to see it's a good practice? So I searched out and started doing this evidence-based research. And why don't we do randomized crossover clinical trials? Of course, there are thousands of them going on in India. But hang on. Why don't we use the technology that we have in Western parts of Europe using my expertise, because I carry out Western-based uh, methods of research. We have validated those models. We have more than 100 publications in, in, in each of these areas. Why don't we carry out that kind of research in a Western setting? And then we can validate. And when we publish, we are actually talking about evidence-based medicine. And so here is a, what I believe will be a classical approach that I would like to take here. That, for example, if we have an Ayurvedic preparation, so here is the Ayurvedic preparation, for example. Or this is, you know, as we, uh, I mean, many of us are familiar, you know, what do we see in these powders here? They, we see different things. But if we just give this to somebody and say it works very well, this could cause a lot of problems. I say, you give me your powders, we're going to do a whole study. We're going to do an analysis of the powder, find out the pure form of the powder, and then see it in our labs to see how an exposure, for example, on the left-hand side, leads to the responses. And we are talking all about the, the genome, all the way deep level, which you will be hearing from our colleagues again, uh, Professor Madan Tangavelu, of course. So uh, these are the aspects you can follow all the way. Then you can take the particular extract, here again repeat, a purified extract, put it in different kind of uh, cell cultures and you see which proteins get up, uh, upgraded or you know, downgraded. And then once we have some evidence, we can then really do this assessment, for example, in animal models that have some knockout, you know, classically, this is what we do in a typical drug. For example, if a new protein has been found out or a new drug has been going to be tested, this is what we do. So why don't we do that same for an Ayurvedic product? And the same goes for aging. You again heard from our, our previous presenter, we are talking about a significant increase in aging persons, which is amazing. This is a great thing Western medicine has done. We, we, we live longer, awesome. I also want to live longer like most of us. But of course, here you can see on this here, the graph clearly shows the additional cost that the EU, for example, these are EU countries here, would have to come up with just to cope up with you know the additional cost of living for those persons. Now that is good. And we also routinely, this is a typical model that I as a medical practitioner use. This is a, a diabetic who actually had a stroke. We measure in them what happens to the blood flow in the brain, different parts of the body. Now, why can't we do the same studies where we give this our medical extract or any of the products that we are talking about, a purified product, for example, from Ayurveda, or even for that matter, if this person is doing yoga or meditation, we can monitor them before and after using the tools that I use routinely, for example, in our laboratories. We measure blood flow to the brain. And of course, you will also hear from our colleagues, uh, Professor Maximilian Moza, who has worked for years on the year on the area of heart rate variability, which is simply how relaxed are you, how calm are you. So you can actually do that just from your heart rate, and also from your sleep. You heard from the previous uh, presenter about sleep. You can actually do this aspect. So I am just saying, if we are now saying yoga, meditation, whatever other aspects are actually improving our mental health as well as sleep quality, we can quantify them using the de devices that we have. What about the, the lining of the arteries? Being a medical doctor, I think uh, uh, this would be very interesting for me to explain this to you. Of course, the, you know, the arteries have lining and you know, inside the arteries, we, we all know there is a high incidence of you know, people getting heart attacks, strokes, but we can actually measure, measure those changes. In graphs, we routinely measure changes that happen in the artery and there is no needle there. So you can see just using an ultrasound gives us what is happening. So we are doing that for all kinds of products, like before and after exercise. We do this in old person, before and after they take melatonin. Why can't we do this also in our uh, persons who do meditation, yoga, or for that matter, any other Ayurvedic medication they take? This is a very simple way where we just monitor how fast the blood is flowing from the neck, for example, to the different different arteries in the legs, for example. So if your arteries are stiff, there will be a different uh, flow. 
Again, non-invasive way. People just come, we just measure. You can look into the retina because retina is the window. You know, we all know eye is the window to the brain. But if you look at a simple way of looking in the retina, you will see very small arteries. And the changes will happen, as you will all agree with me, changes will happen in the small arteries much, much before they will happen in the bigger arteries. So why don't we look at the, at the retina? Very simple way, it's just a Canon camera, the one you shoot your pictures with. Or you can actually have a handheld camera. The child is very happy. Again, no need to put any drugs in the eye. It's not painful, anybody can measure. But we are actually doing these studies already in Austria. And I'm just asking myself, if we are already doing these medicine, uh, these studies that are, you know, pre and post, let's say, exercise intervention, pre and post, you know, rehabilitation in a cardiac rehab center, you'll be hearing from our colleague, Dr. Raina Piha, where we actually did measurements in the cardiac rehabilitation and tried to understand. You see this particular one, blood, saliva, hair measurements. We routinely collect blood samples from patients, also saliva, which of course is not uh, painful, just saliva, or hair, which is again not painful, you can actually measure the stress in the hair. One month of uh, stress is actually reflected in one centimeter of hair. If we measure before and after an intervention, let's say, uh, you know, Ayurvedic medication or Ayurvedic products, or for that matter, rehabilitation involving yoga or meditation, we can do that. And what will we see? A lot of changes that happen at the gene level. Now, we're talking very deep. We routinely do that. And look at this confusing picture. It just shows you what each gene does to our body. So we'll be able to actually quantify what is the precise role of that Ayurvedic pure extract that has worked and that has resulted in, 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 a, in, a, in a result. And when we produce this kind of evidence, there's nobody who is actually going to be uh, refusing our claim. And we will never be shot down as one of those things that is called hocus pocus, you know, like in Indian words, jadu tona, or in, uh, you know, the commonly used uh, European word hocus pocus, you know, wow, that's magic. This is not black magic, neither is this voodoo. This is actually evidence-based medicine, and it is our duty as actually Western-based practitioners who use standard Western medicine to test and validate it. And again, as I keep on repeating, I am not an Ayurveda practitioner. And when I publish, I'm a professor at the university, at a Western university, we do ethics approval, we, there is no conflict, and we publish these results, which are completely double blind, sometimes even triple blind, in the sense that the statistics professor who does this doesn't even know what those groups were in, then we can validate those studies. And that is what we have been doing in Graz over the years together, thanks to our colleagues in, the, uh, of course, Ayush, who have very much supported us. The Ministry of Ayush has amazingly supported us over the years to carry out these symposia, as well as to reach out uh, collaborations with them. So we have uh, existing collaborations with, with you know, the Ayush in, in, in India, the Ministry of Ayurveda and Yoga, and, uh, and we do amazing work with them. We have a, a MOU with them, even a Medical University of Graz with uh, the All India Institute of Ayurvedic Research in New Delhi. And we, we combine together to do research because I believe it is when we join our forces that our colleagues from India, for example, can provide their evidence-based pure extract, bring it to us. We do our evidence-based medicine using exactly the same methods that we have used over the last 50 years to validate drugs in the market. But here we are talking about health promotion activities as well. What about yoga? What about meditation? And you'll be hearing during the course of this, our conference here, you'll be hearing a lot of presenters and some of the data also from Graz, where we actually did in the rehabilitation clinic in Graz, where after surgery, patients were rehabilitated for, for one month and we got ethics approval. We carried out studies where the group of persons got their normal rehab, other group got their normal rehab plus yoga, plus meditation as well. So using experts, then today we are generating that evidence. And I believe until that time that we generate this evidence, I'm afraid we will really be just where most people have these wild, wild conceptions, actually wild and wrong conceptions about complementary. They keep on calling it complementary alternative. I don't think it's complementary or alternative at all. I actually think this is integrative health promotion practices, like when to sleep, what is your body constitution, what food should you eat, how many hours should you sleep, what should you do to your mind, like, you know, sure. but what do you do with your mind? 
And I think it's important, just like we take a bath every day, I think we need to also cleanse our mind. And also we need to do, you know, cognitive cleansing as well. So I believe, and I thank really the Ministry of Ayush, as well as our partners in, in Graz, as well, of course, colleagues who are sitting in the conference today for this amazing work. And we keep on organizing this symposia to do this. But last point, I would just like to suggest, we have now introduced integrative and complementary course in Graz that we carry out to our medical students. We train medical students who are now thought clearly on health promoting practices to remove Ayurveda and all these uh, words that are completely sounding like strange to a typical European, for example, how to remove that and bring it into the realm of real active research. Thank Dr. you so much. Dr. Goswami, thank you so much. That was Dr. Goswami. Thank you for your contribution to our platform. Thank you very much. Thank you.